Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us on this edition of The View on Africa. My name is Akionla Olojo. I'm a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies. And here I work with colleagues who uh, are in a program that keeps a very keen eye on transnational threats and international crime. Um, today I'll be discussing about the role of Islamic clerics in addressing the Boko Haram crisis. So I'll be asking one main question. Why are Islamic clerics relevant to the campaign uh, against Boko Haram in Nigeria? Why are Islamic clerics critical for the wider struggle against violent extremism in general? So I'll be offering two main responses, and in explaining my arguments, I'll also give you a sense of the context we're talking about. Now, one of the most significant security challenges to confront uh, the Nigerian state over the last decade is the Boko Haram crisis. Now, this is a crisis which has affected the northern region of Nigeria, of which the northeast zone has particularly suffered the worst shocks of violence. Now, most of the time we hear of um, fatality figures in the range of 30,000, sometimes higher, as high as 32,000 or even more. Um, we don't really have a precise figure you know, regarding the fatalities, but it's quite high. And the Boko Haram crisis has, you know, it's quite complex. It has various sides to it. Um, there are state and non-state actors involved. Um, we have a transnational aspect to it. Um, there is a serious humanitarian um, situation uh, linked to it, of which um, there is also the adverse impact of, impact of climate change. Um, there is also a criminal justice dimension to this. Now, in addressing the crisis, it requires multiple levels of management. And um, I mean, there are those who argue, and quite validly, that um, the socioeconomic deprivation aspect should be addressed, and that is very true. Um, there are those who argue that, okay, um, politically, um, there must be uh, good governance, you know, addressing the governance deficits, there must be political will, and these are all very important. Um, safeguarding the rule of law, for instance. Um, there are issues regarding um, up upholding human rights. So these are all very pertinent. But beyond these issues, there is a very important ideological component of the crisis, which requires a specific type of community actor. Now, this type of actor also must have a type of skill set in order to effectively address the ideological component. Now, um, based on fieldwork which I happen to have conducted in places like Maiduguri in Borno State, in the northeast of Nigeria, um, I also um, went to other parts of northern Nigeria, such as Sokoto State in the northwest. Um, I also um, had the chance to go beyond the border to places like Niger on the northwestern frontier of Nigeria. Um, based on the evidence, um, it is clear that there is the ideological aspect of the crisis. And Islamic clerics, I argue, are most suited to address these aspects or at least can contribute to addressing the ideological challenge posed by Boko Haram. Now, I argue this for two main reasons. Number one, Islamic clerics are most familiar with the essential doctrinal elements that are required to deconstruct the ideological narrative pushed by Boko Haram. Number two, Islamic clerics occupy a very central role at the heart of communal mobilization from which resistance against Boko Haram can emerge. So I'll take these two uh, main points, one after the other. And um, you know, regarding the first one, I mean, clearly we have um, arguments about, OK, um, in the present day period, um, Boko Haram isn't particularly trying to preach or proselytize to make people join. Uh, we have more of abductions taking place, people being forced to join the group as members. While that is true, we must bear in mind that Boko Haram actually started out in its early days with preaching. Now, the group was very much engaged in preaching its message across northern Nigeria. Um, I still recall in 2014, and again in 2015, um, somewhere in the northwest of Nigeria, I was in Sokoto State, and I met people who talked about how they saw Mohammed Yusuf, you know, preaching in the town, in the city. Um, they listened to him, they heard him, um, there is evidence to, to prove that some people joined and some people had to migrate away from places like that. But there were most of the people there who did not join. Now, we must also bear in mind that the Boko Haram crisis, it's not the first type 
uh, you know, it's not the first kind of crisis uh, to occur in Nigeria. Nigeria has witnessed in the past this type of situation. In the 1980s, between 1980 and 1985, we had what was known as the Maitatsini crisis. It followed the same trend. Um, we had high fatalities. Um, perhaps the main difference between the Maitatsini crisis and what we're witnessing today is the fact that the fatality figures are much higher. Another main difference is the fact that um, there is the phenomenon of suicide attacks in the case of Boko Haram. So of course it's more dreadful, but then it's the same kind of narrative. And there's an ideology that pushes this. So when we take a long-term perspective, we need to understand that addressing this crisis at its root, beyond socioeconomic factors and politics, there must be an identification of those actors like Islamic clerics who can contribute to sending counter messages, counter speech, and also counter narratives in general. Now, we must also bear in mind that clerics understand the kind of exclusivist narrative that Boko Haram uses. Boko Haram's main objective is to replace what exists in Nigeria with a caliphate. Now, that is located in a religious context. Boko Haram makes reference to what was known as the Sokoto Caliphate. It uses most of these uh, religious narratives to justify its goal. So at the end of the day, even if you solve poverty, if you solve politics, or you resolve all those very important issues, the ideological aspect must be addressed. Now, Islamic clerics are known uh, not only in Nigeria, but beyond Nigeria. There are cases, you know, very good examples of clerics who have actually made an attempt, a very bold attempt to deconstruct um, such ideological narratives pushed by terror groups. So you have a good example, um, for instance, following the London bombings in 2005, July that year. Um, there were attacks in London, and um, two weeks following the attacks, we had um, a cleric um, based at the University of Oxford. His name is Sheikh Afifi Alakiti. And um, following the attacks, you know, he wrote a book. And in fact, the book um, which I have in my hand here um, actually was considered as a fatwa against the ideology of uh, the assailants of the attack. And in that book, you know, like um, most, what most other clerics have done, they identify the particular doctrines and the tenets, the ideas that these groups use and exploit. So for instance, you have the prohibition of the killing of civilians who are categorized under the, uh, under the non-combatant category. So you have clerics who are able to specifically pinpoint these gray areas and contest the ideology of groups like Boko Haram. Now, within Nigeria, in the Northwest, I mentioned Sokoto State. Now, you had cases where clerics actually challenged what Boko Haram was um, preaching about. Um, Boko Haram, um, the first leader actually, Mohammed Yusuf, when he was still alive, he visited Sokoto State in 2006, and he revisited again in 2009. Now, like I mentioned earlier, we had those who listened to him and who heard what he said. And then the clerics also saw what was happening, and they challenged it. Now, we have clerics who tried to contest those areas which he raised. And this is not to suggest that um, it was only in the Northwest where clerics contested the ideas. In the Northeast, which really is the epicenter of the crisis, in Maiduguri, Borno State, we had clerics who um, actually stood up to the ideas of Boko Haram. Um, most of them were killed. Um, it's on record that between 2010 and 2013, at least officially, we had about 18 clerics who were targeted by Boko Haram. Um, Boko Haram targeted these clerics not only because of the kind of exclusivist narrative the group has, but because they consider clerics as very powerful community actors that can mobilize against them. Now, this brings me to my second point. I mentioned something about um, how clerics can be very powerful mobilizers. Now, if you look at the communities affected by violent extremism in general, um, we realize that in order to counter these threats, it's beyond the actions of just one actor. It's not about just the government um, you know, launching a force. You know, it's more than just the use of force. It's more than you know, military might. We need to go beyond that. Uh, there is a need to recognize that it's really a battle over ideas. It's a battle that involves propaganda. It's a battle and a struggle over winning hearts and minds. Now, this is where clerics come in again. Um, in terms of mobilization, we find that in northern Nigeria, clerics 
are actually well connected with some of the powerful platforms and the organizations that can be used as, um, as um, potent forces against Boko Haram. Um, two examples, for instance, we have the National Council of Muslim Youth Organizations. We also have uh, the Muslim Student Society of Nigeria. Now, these are just two examples. There are numerous others. Now, these two platforms, we have clerics who are patrons of them. We have clerics who are mentors, who actually offer theological guidance to the vast majority of the youth who are affiliated to them. And we must bear in mind that the youth demographic are actually that particular um, you know, demographic that are targeted by groups like Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, ISIS. It's the youth, you know, because we find many of them disenchanted, of course. So they target the youth, and then we have them at the same time being members of these organizations. So clerics can actually use these platforms to guide them. Now, there might be those who will argue, okay, um, even though clerics can use these platforms, what are they actually preaching? Um, there is, of course, the need to recognize that there is a risk in allowing certain clerics to rise to a position of influence. That is well, you know, it's acknowledged. But at the same time, we must also accept the fact that there is tremendous influence that can be exerted using these platforms. Now, if we go beyond this, we have cases where clerics also use the social media platforms. Um, we have clerics, some of whom I've met, who actually use YouTube channels um, to preach their messages. There are clerics who have an online presence. There are clerics who actually have videos of the sermons they preach. And some of these videos are transmitted so easily in this modern age. Um, we have situations where clerics are also connected with um, you know, key local actors. We have cases where traditional institutions, um, an emir, for instance, in an emirate, um, a sultan in a sultanate. We have cases where even beyond the state leadership, we have the district heads, the, uh, the, the village heads, we have the ward heads, and a number of other you know, local actors. And you know, we, we also need to understand that it's, it's really a collective struggle. It's, it's a synergy of efforts and clerics are actually connected with most of these local actors. So we find cases where, for instance, an emir in charge of a particular territory consults a cleric for his opinion. Um, we have cases where clerics actually meet and have weekly uh, reunions, and they discuss some of the pertinent national debates. And you know, talking about that, you know, it's also important to mention that uh, even in the places of worship, in mosques, for instance, um, we have clerics who have direct access to the pulpit. So they are able to transmit um, some of the messages they have. And uh, we have people who use these messages, who listen to them, and use them to plug into the social political scene. So for instance, we have those who go to the mosque and they listen. And then, um, for instance, some years in Nigeria, there, were, there was this big debate about the Sharia. Should it or should it not be instituted in the country? And we had a number of uh, northern Nigerian states that actually uh, integrated it into their constitutions. But then it was a big debate. Some of these issues were contested you know, in various <coughs> spaces. We had places in the mosque where people went to, they listened, and then they go back into the communities and they act upon them. So we find that there is, you know, there's a need to recognize that there is tremendous influence which clerics can actually use.